So students, today I bring to you a very important topic for your examinations. In the previous class, we spoke about controlled ovarian stimulation protocols. And that lecture was very important because this is not the kind of lecture you will find in your books. So all of you who have not seen that lecture, you kindly uh, go and watch it in my YouTube channel. You, if you want to know more about ovarian stimulation protocols, because I have uh, in my lecture taken a specific protocols which are which have, which have been included over a period of research from a good institute where IVF is being done, and these protocols were latestly uh, you know latest published in the 2019 journal, and from there I have taken examples just to make you understand it better. It's not that you have to write it specifically in the exam, but it's just to make you understand how these uh, controlled ovarian stimulation protocols work. Because when I was at your age. You know the step up, step down, antagonist protocol, agonist protocol, fixed dose, multiple dose. I was not able to understand until and unless I had examples in front of me. And I've tried to include just that in that lecture. So I hope that it's uh, and the kind of feedback that I've got from my students. I'm really happy that you're able to understand. And those of you who are new to this, who are trying to understand and finding difficult from the book because it is difficult from the books it's not easy to understand maybe you will get the gist of it but you will not be able to understand the uh, practicality of it so i've tried to include that in my lecture and uh, you can go forward and look to it and the ones who want a detailed description they can subscribe to my classes my number is flashing on the um, uh, screen right now so you can always and always <coughs> approach me for that in the same way today's class i have tried to make it very practical when i talk about ovulation induction protocols see controlled ovarian stimulation this was another thing that i tried to explain to you in the last class when we <clears throat> when we talk about controlled ovarian stimulation and when we talk about ovulation induction what is the difference <clears throat> when i'm doing ovulation induction the name itself suggests i at least want one mature oocyte for the fertilization and for the you know conception when I'm doing controlled ovarian stimulation, I'm talking about a cohort of follicles. I want more follicles to grow, more follicles to mature. Why? Because I want an oocyte retrieval and a better chance at, at, uh, at you know, pregnancy. And this is basically, I'm talking in terms of IVF context. So let's talk about assisted reproductive technology, ART context. But when I'm talking about ovulation induction, it is more practical, more easy and everyday you know, um, uh, desk job of a, of a uh, gynecologist who is just opening her clinic and who is seeing, and you know, infertility cases. So um, why is it important? Why is it common? Is because that's the first step that you give to a couple in which you usually find no stark, you know, cause for infertility. To subfertile couples, patients with PCOS who are not able to get pregnant, the first step is ovulation induction. And it has various protocols, okay? which I'm going to get to later on. On the very outside, I'm just trying to tell you the difference between ovulation induction and controlled ovarian stimulation. So if you want to know more about controlled ovarian stimulation, you can please um, refer to my lecture. But if you want to know about ovarian stimulation, uh, sorry, ovulation induction protocols, this is the class for you. Now, what exactly do you want to do by ovulation induction? What you're trying to do in a female who is kind of subfertile, in which some chronic ovulation, because usually of the PCOS case, will not be able to have, you know, um, um, would not be able to uh, ovulate every month. And you're just trying to give a kick to this particular, um, you know, problem of hers. And you're timing the ovulation so that you can help her by either... Um, explaining to her the fertile period or the period around uh, you know in, uh, in the period to have intercourse or you want to assist her by giving by uh, by doing an IUI either IUI donor or IUI husband and uh, for as far as IUI is concerned I have my notes on that so all my students they can refer to my notes about IUI it's the, given in most of the books but um, I have elaborated a little more in my own notes about IUI. So those of you who want to study in depth about IUI, because the IUI procedure is asked. So you can always refer to my notes about, it's, it's concerning whole semen and then processed semen. How do you process it? Why is it processed? So on and so forth. The timing of IUI, why, when do you give NCG trigger? What do you see when you do, when you give an NCG trigger? And what time after an NCG trigger should you be uh, doing IUI? Stuff like that. So anyways, let's come back to ovulation induction now. <clears throat> Uh, today, I'm going to follow the protocols of ovulation induction, uh, one of which uh, is from uh, 
<coughs> Dr. Nanta Palshetkar, that is from, of course, you know that she is uh, the infertility specialist at Leelavati Hospital. And uh, a few protocols which are also followed elsewhere, which which have not been specifically included in that, uh, you know, it's a, it's actually a foxy focus uh, um, uh, paper, which is written by Dr. Nandita Palshetkar. But uh, uh, some of the protocols have taken from her because they're actually followed and they are very popular protocols. And some of them also are, I'm going to include in it because they are also equally followed in our day-to-day -day life uh, and before that um, before taking up ovulation induction let me just give you a brief description about something which I've written over here on this side of the board see uh, ovulation um, let's talk about an ovulatory disorders they are included they are divided into WHO 1 2 and 3 categories now, WHO1 category is in which you have hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. That means something is wrong with the hypothalamus, something is wrong with the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. So something is wrong with the hypothalamus. And because of that, you know, something is going on wrong, henceforth. Constitutional disorders and so on uh, will lead to that. WHO type 2 uh, in ovulation disorder is normal, normal hyper, this thing, uh, gonadotropic, but an ovulation. Everything is right. But there is some problem, PCOS comes into this category. Uh, then comes a third, that means hypergonadotropic hypogonadism. Uh, that means something is wrong with the ovary. Either it is resistant ovary or it has gone into premature ovarian failure. So that is uh, group number three. And why was I trying to tell you this is because if, if the matter is above and beyond your hands, that means... If there is constitutional disorder, you cannot help her with ovulation induction. If there is this category in which there is premature ovarian failure, the ovary has failed. Premature ovarian failure, POF, you can't help her again with these protocols. So you should be able to judge your cases properly. In a nutshell, I'm trying to tell you ovulation induction, the prerequisites of ovulation induction. That means at least baseline, you should be able to know that her, uh, you know, what is the normal FSH, LH and E2 in her body. That means FSH and LH should not be very high, should not be very low and her E2 levels again should not be very low. That means you'll not be able to even induce for ovulation. You'll not be able to get anything out of it. A resistant ovary might respond sooner than later. But a premature ovarian failure will not be able to respond. So you should know the categories. And how will you know that? A serum FSH LH level above 10 should raise an alarm. A serum E2 level of less than 100 should be, should be observed. So you should be at least able to understand how is this patient going to proceed with these th these values. I'm not del deliberately including C uh, serum AMH over here, though it should have been included. A very low serum AMH level again tells you or hints towards a towards an ovarian failure or at least a resistant ovary. So you should be able to see these parameters first. And if everything is okay, the patient is usual, you know, just looking seemingly subfertile for whatever reasons be it. You know, you've done her base baseline levels of thyroid, prolactin, and you've done her um, workup of FSH, LH, everything is like within the normal limits, within the normal limits. It's still, it's been a year and she's not being able to conceive despite the fact that she's cohabitating with her husband. You've already done the semen profile and it is like borderline, not very good, not very bad. And she's not able to conceive. The other thing you have to be very sure is HSG. Her tubes are okay. Then you proceed forward with explaining her the importance of ovulation induction along with an IUI. So now let's move forward and understand the different protocols of ovulation induction. In one, you have clomiphene citrate or letrulose used alone. What is the logic behind using clom and letrulose? It's actually beyond the scope of this lecture, but in a nutshell, I'll tell you. Basically, they exert an anti-estrogenic action. We call them selective estrogen receptor modulator. So they have anti-estrogenic effect as a result of which the, 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 uh, you know, the hypothalamus senses a low estrogenic state and starts firing more of FSH, more of LH, which again stimulate the ovary to release, you know, and to mature, you know, one, at least one um, uh, ovarian follicle. And that's, that does a job. Basically, that is it. So clomiphene citrate or letrulose used alone. 
The second protocol is clome or clome uh, clomiphenicated or lipolose used along with HCG trigger. Then comes the gonadotropins. All right, HMG or FSH along with HCG trigger. Then comes the last protocol which I'll be talking about. After that, of course, the protocols are the ones you've already dealt with in the controlled ovarian stimulation class, the class in which I've spoken in detail about the step up protocol, the step down protocol the agonist, antagonist protocol, long protocol, short protocol, stuff like that. So anyways, um, clomiphene citrate plus either of these gonadotropins along with HCG trigger. But yes, of course, over here also, I'll be including the step up and step down because they are related to the gonadotropins, not the GnRH agonist or antagonist. So I'll be including that as well in this lecture. So uh, anyways, these were amongst the, uh, the different kind of protocols. So let, let's discuss them one by one.